So we're going to attempt as well, like streaming this tonight. Not sure how it's going to go. It's my first time setting this up at Mobify, so um, hopefully that'll pop up on YouTube in like a minute or two. Uh, ah, cool. Okay, I think we're live. We're on the internet live. Oh my god, we made it big. We made it, guys. <laughs> okay, a um, few of you, if you come to some uh, Android meetups before or uh, just chatted through the meetup group, my name's Mike. You might have uh, interacted with me before in some way, shape, or form. Um, Ian approached me a couple months back. Just uh, He runs one of the iOS uh, dev meetup groups in Vancouver as well, and he's interested in helping out, so you'll probably see more of Ian as well. Uh, we're going to try to commit to getting like a more regular cadence with uh, sort of like good structure of speakers and events and sort of see what you guys want so we can actually uh, do a better job delivering to this meetup group. Um, a few quick administrative things. If you need to go use the washroom, there's like little washroom signs at the back door there. They kind of lead you around the other side of this office. It's shaped like a square, like square hallways, and it's on the exact opposite side of the square that we're on right now. Um, so just keep following them. There's a men's and ladies room. Um, one other note for speakers tonight. Uh, since we are streaming, if you're if you're talking like this, not if you're not talking to the mic, the people on line or like who watch this video later, because I think we're going to try to post it somewhere. Uh, they won't be able to hear what you're saying, so try to talk into the mic. You can take it out of the mic stand if you like to w walk around a little bit or something and like point at things or leave it in, whatever. But uh, we might uh, prod you about that. Um, if people have questions, uh, I think we might, we have a second mic that we can try to run to people, but uh, it's kind of a pain in the butt to try and run between people. So if you have a question and the person who's asking the question doesn't have a microphone and you're speaking, if you could just repeat the question into the microphone before, that would be great as well. Uh, we might try and stop you as well, just so people online know what you're asking. Um, but yeah, without any further ado, here's Ian to give you some uh, updates. So hello. Um, as he said, my name is Ian Sim, um, and yeah, uh, I started talking about trying to um, get involved with uh, this meetup to try to get, um, as you mentioned, a more regular cadence and um, really grow a better community. Um, here in Vancouver, I think that, um, you know, there is a lot of really good work being done, but um, Often we're in our own companies, we can't see what others are doing in other companies, we don't see enough of the activity that's going on, going on around us. Um, I feel this way, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that most of you do as well. Um, so, you know, really we are um, wanting to look at this problem and try to do something about it, try to um, uh, give a place that we can um, come to interact, learn, be proud of our work. So the point is um, that this is about Android. Uh, the topic here is is for Android developers. You know, Vancouver Android Developers is the name of the group. Um, there are other people that do things within the Android ecosystem, and we welcome them as well. Um, we are, um, you know, what I'm what I've got up here is our mission, and you know, I'm not going to read all of it out directly, but really what I'm trying to say here is that we want to. Um, give you what you need to grow in your, in your um, workplaces and in your careers, um, make space for networking opportunities, um, but you know, really increase the overall visibility of what we do here in Vancouver and make Vancouver a center of excellence for app development, for Android specific app development. Um, make all of you as a community more visible to the, the um, uh, business people that are making decisions around the, the industry that we're in. Um, so the people are coming here rather than going to say Toronto or say the, the Valley. Uh, we're trying to make this a better place and make it more well known for that. Um, it's your group and I'm going to look at you guys to make it better. Um, specifically, that means um, please suggest speakers or suggest uh, speakers you'd like to see. Uh, you know, we can maybe reach out to people that you uh, know in the industry and, and bring them in. Um, if you've got a connection, um, don't want to get involved directly, you know, just uh, uh, set something up and we'll follow up on it. So please, uh, 
do your part. Um, tonight is made possible by Mobify. Um, so thank you, Mobify. Um, is Mike? He's downstairs? Okay. Great. Um, so um, Mofi is hosting tonight. Um, they've, they've done a lot of work for um, uh, supporting Android in town um, with, with um, both Mike and with uh, one of our speakers tonight, Liz. Um, and they're, they're great in terms of involvement with the community. Um, my own company, Radical, is also sponsoring tonight, uh, for pizza, et cetera. Moving on. Um, <laughs> uh, so, you know, we are Vancouver Android developers. Um, I'm just trying to mention here that we're also trying to reach out to folks. Uh, so, Van Android, you can now find on Twitter. Please follow it and um, please communicate with it back and forth. As part of the regular running of events, we're going to try and have um, announcements. So if you've got something that you want to have said at one of our future um, events, please contact one of us, um, uh, either myself. You can see emails here. I need to get that turned off quickly. Um, or um, uh, to Mike. So you can see the emails there. Um, just reach out to us through meetup.com or um, through Twitter, et cetera. Lots of different ways to accomplish that. Um, give me a second to see if I can kill that. So, uh, first announcement. Um, coming in the very near future is um, the Vancouver Startup Week and Hackathon. Um, so, uh, I don't have the actual dates for the conference on here, but there is a recruitment fair on the 28th and a hackathon running from the 23rd to the 25th. Um, I think the hackathon is at the TELUS Garden. And, um, you know, ha having uh, attended the event in the past, um, great place to learn about what's going on in the startup world. And, um, you know, there are a number of things that are applicable for our part of the tech industry as well. Um, so go see that, uh, figure out if you'd like to attend, etc. cetera. Uh, so I'm gonna do a little bit of, um, uh, news now for things that are going on within the Android world. Um, so, uh, in the uh, near future, Google looks to be having an event on the on October fourth. Um, expecting some new hardware, maybe some phones, maybe some other devices. Uh, one of the things. Uh, so the first part of this news is going to be less newsy and more rumory. I should point that out because <laughs> uh, of our timing. Things haven't been announced yet, so we're going to talk about what people are thinking is going to come out. Um, so is this the end of Nexus phones? Um, it looks like the name Nexus is going to probably go away uh, and be replaced by the Pixel name. Uh, so there have been two devices that have been being talked about. The um, previous names to them were the Nexus Sailfish and the Nexus Marlin. Uh, so these are the two new devices coming out to replace the 5X and the 6. Um, you can see here that uh, the first one's a 5-inch 1080p display um, with a really fast processor in it. Uh, it's probably going to be one of the fastest process. Well, I think it is the fastest processor in any phone. This will be the first set of phones to use it. Um, you can see the rest of the specs there. I won't go too far. Way down there, the, the iPhone 7 is a 720p device. Just pointing that out. <laughs> <laughs> and it'll look something like that. <coughs> and something like that. Um, so there's two, uh, two variations of it, uh, the Pixel and the Pixel XL, uh, Sailfish and Marlin. Um, this one's got a bigger screen than the other, 5.5 inch and more pixels. Uh, same fast processor and lots of similar other things. Um, but that's, uh, this was taken from a case leak. Uh, so it's one of the companies making cases put their stuff out a little too early. So that's probably one of the best indications of what it's gonna look like. I don't actually know which phone that is of. And it includes a headphone jack. <laughs> Um, 
So both devices are expected to run um, a tweaked or improved version. So um, we're all used to the, um, the Nexus devices being stock Android. And it looks like that's gonna be one of the differences here, that um, these devices are no longer just going to be a reference phone. They're gonna be the, um, the flagship. Uh, they're gonna try and compete, I think, better with the Apple devices. And uh, in doing so, they are going to tweak the UI, um, similar to what the other vendors do. Uh, hopefully, and I expect this does not mean that it'll delay like the other vendors do with rolling out their updates to it. They are gonna have to maintain a little bit more code, but it's part of the same code base, it probably gets released at the same time as my expectation. Um, the rest of this is still rumory, but is based on things we've already seen. Um, so uh, the other thing that's gonna be talked about on the fourth is likely gonna be the Google Home device. Um, so, you know, the, the OK Google-based interaction to, um, to provide the Google Assistant uh, way of controlling devices within your home, it's basically a speaker. A uh, speaker that looks like a little vase or a, uh, I'm not too sure what that thing looks like. Um, but uh, there's a number of people are getting quite excited about that. Uh, the other part that seems to be coming out is the Google Daydream stuff, Google's VR platform. Um, in this case, Google has already released the reference um, uh, information about the platform. In other words, how to build devices, and vendors are starting to build those devices already. It looks like Google's likely to talk about their own device as well. Again, probably similar in that they're, I think, trying to compete uh, directly. So not just a reference device, but maybe something more. Um, if you haven't seen anything from the Daydream platform, um, it comes with uh, a controller device that you can see down here in the corner. Um, and kind of a you know, key portion of the, of the overall experience, but sort of gives you a bit of an idea of what this platform is gonna look like. So, um, now stuff that uh, is less rumory. Um, Android 7. Uh, Here's a quick list of things that we're expecting to see in terms of APIs and platforms. I'm not gonna get very technical here, I'm just gonna try and cover things quickly. Um, but yeah, uh, there's, there's a long list of things in there, including new emoji. Um, uh, you know, there's, I mentioned there's support there for the Google VR SDK for both D Daydream and Cardboard as part of what they're doing with the hardware for Daydream. Um, there's technical things like the new signing scheme for how you release your APKs. Um, Multi-window notifications. I'm gonna cover some of these things, I think, in some of the next couple of slides. Uh, so notifications. Um, getting more advanced, getting fancier. Uh, you can see a combination on the side there um, of the um, uh, bundled notifications. So your notifications can be collected up and uh, interacted with as a group. Um, make more sense of the sort of stream of things that are coming out. Um, the other two images are showing direct responses, uh, direct reply, uh, in terms of interacting with notifications directly from, from the, the uh, dropdown. Um, Multi-window support, uh, what can I say here? Um, so most apps are probably gonna need to do some sort of a a review around this. Uh, it will have a handling without you doing work. So if anything before I think API 23 uh, is gonna be um, forced to do a resize when the, when the multi-screen happens. Um, you can control it better. Uh, you know, s special things that manufacturers can do if they know they've got a large device and that's gonna be more applicable. Um, interesting and useful stuff. Probably going to mess up a cer certain number of apps. Um, the Pixel Launcher, the, also known as the, the Nexus Launcher. Um, so the fancy bar on the side, the, the Google search bar has kind of been shrunk and moved over. I believe it's got interaction with um, the, the Google Now side of things, the Google Assistant. Um, but you can see things are gonna look a little different. The quick settings tile API allows you to take your application and configure um, your own settings applets or, or tiles to be put into this uh, view in the dropdown. So um, the ability to put your stuff in there and um, sort of a drag and drop the ability to place things. 
um, it's user controlled, so they're the ones actually taking advantage of what you provide for them. Um, and then 3D side of things, uh, Vulkan is being introduced and um, OpenGL ES at the same time. So one of the points of mentioning those together is Vulkan is very hardware specific. Um, the docs kind of mention 5X, 6P and Nexus Player, but it's gonna be things that support it. I kind of guess that some of the Tegra chips as well are gonna be applicable there, but um, unclear right now, for me at least. Um, but you're getting better support for um, 3D rendering. The Vulkan API is being looked at as a very efficient uh, way of doing um, new things. Uh, I think Epic Unreal Engine has um, got some demos out there for it, if you're curious. Um, OpenGL ES starts adding, um, I think it's all but one of the extensions from the Android extension pack and gives you uh, more efficient ways of doing things with buffers and being able to batch um, base vertex calls, uh, be able to draw more at once in a batch. Uh, and the surface view uh, reduces power usage, which is kind of neat. So I'm done with my part. Sorry for boring you. Um, now we're gonna get some interesting people to do some talks. Um, first off is Albert Lowe, uh, talking about Retrofit 2, yesterday and today. Nice tinting. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name's uh, Albert. I work at uh, p and Digital Media as a senior Android developer, in, and we make a photo printing platform. So in the Play Store, if you go look at the Costco app, or on the Play Store, if you go, if you happen to be in the UK and you download the Tesco app, uh, that, that's us. Uh, so it allows you to download uh, uh, photos from your phone or from cloud media and print them out at any Costco store, um, or if you're a Tesco at any Tesco store. So when I'm not working my day job, I, I also work on Android because I like Android. So uh, I've been consulting for a couple of companies. Uh, one of them is Addis Clinic, which I'll be using uh, my demo is based off of uh, Addis Clinic, they, they make this telemedicine uh, application where uh, the patient uh, out in Africa, they, they, they enter some patient information, they send it back to uh, Boston uh, via LTE, and there's volunteer doctors that, that diagnose these patients, and then they send back the patient data back to, out to the uh, community medical center. So that's one of the, my jobs. The other one, I'm consulting with is uh, as a startup. They, they, they're making a, a social networking app. Um, it's very interesting, but I can't really talk about it yet because they're about to launch. So what am I going to talk about today? I'm, I'm going to talk about why, why we want to use Retrofit in the first place. What's the whole motivation for it? And then I'll bring in some of my own perspective from from actually working, having worked on what retrofit. So what I'm doing right now with Addis Clinic is I, I'm, I'm dealing with their, uh, what is it, their, their Apache client uh, backend. And, and uh, it's, it's a lot of work. And uh, that, that's what motivated me to, to look for alternatives. And I'll, I'll dive into that a bit more too. Um, and 
Yeah, so I'll give some of my perspective on that. And then I'll, I'll talk about some of the, the uh, gotchas and uh, how, how I evolved my own code to make it better and more robust and hopefully you know, share some of that um, best practices with you guys as well. And if there's time and permitting, I, I can run through a, a demo of, uh, of the app. Okay, so before, before uh, life before retrofit was, if you want to talk to a, a back-end client, a back-end API, you basically had to either write your own, um, write your own client, or you could use like Apache client, URL, HTTP connection to create your data and send it off to the back-end and hopefully get something back before. <laughs> So those were your two choices. And if you look at HTT or URL connection as an example, this is, this is something uh, I'm, I'm dealing with um, right now at Addis Clinic. Um, this is working. It's nice. You know, why, why change it if it ain't broken? Uh, the first problem is there, there's all these lines of code here and you're not even getting your data yet. So you have to write all this stuff just, just to get ready to get to your data. So that, that's okay if you have one request. If you have, like, say, a, a post or, or you have to do a delete or your, 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 your request parameters change, then, then you have to do this all over again. You, you can try and refactor it, make some common methods, but more or less, you're going to do this a lot, and, and you're not even getting your data, which is here. So that, that's a bit of a problem. You have to carry all this baggage with you whenever you want to get something or whenever you want to upload some files over to your API endpoint. So what Retrofit does is it tries to abstract all that away so, so that we don't have to deal with crafting the, the request body. Well, we, we do, but it makes it easier for us to do it, much easier. It's much more flexible. You can change your endpoints much more easily. Uh, the other motivation was um, there, there's a Google API. I, I did this recently. There's a Google API endpoint where you can ask for whether you have a valid token or not. So we're, you know we have Google Drive right now, and I have to download the file, we have to get a valid token, and I have to check whether the token is valid or not. And so with my existing HTTP client, I have to look at how I can use Apache client to, to send out a get request, and, and, and I'm looking at that and seeing, okay, that's X amount of work that I have to do just, just to find out whether my token is valid or not. And then I look at retrofit, and it's, it's like way easier. <laughs> so, so retrofit, um, what, what the big advantage is, it, it turns your um, backend API into, um, into an interface. So you can, you can use your interface to define, to basically model your whole backend uh, with all the different paths. They have a callback structure, which is, it's, it's good and it's bad. It's, it's very good uh, in that it allows you to get your result. Um, but there, there's little gotchas that, that you have to watch out for when you're working with the callback structure. And it's pluggable. So what, what, when Retrofit 1.0 1.0 came out, they had uh, the notions of supporting an Apache client. They had notions of supporting HTTP URL connection or, or any kind of custom client you want. Uh, they decided uh, later on that it wasn't what they wanted to do. So when they came out with uh, Retrofit 2, they, they decided, OK, we only want to support OKHTP OK because uh, the H OK HTTP has specific data that Retrofit can work with much easier. So they dropped support for uh, Apache client, OK URL connection, uh, and all that. Uh, what they gave you, though, is, is a much tighter integration with OK HTTP. And, and they were kind of betting that a lot of people were already using HTTP, and, and we were using OKHTTP, OK so it wasn't a big uh, deal to, for us to just move over to Retrofit 2. Uh, they, they provide interceptors. What, what that is, uh, is it allows you to 
peek, you can intercept any kind of outgoing uh, packet to the API and you can add in your own uh, custom header. So for instance, for like authorization, which I'll talk about later on, you can put in your, your own tokens and that's, that's done, we can do that through interceptors. Uh, Retrofit 2 supports pagination, so with OneDrive, you can, you get back a request, it'll send you another URL and saying, hey, there's more data. So, so Retrofit 2 now allows you to take that next URL for the next page of data and plug it into a new endpoint call. Um, so, so that's Retrofit 2. Uh, it, it's, it's very extensible, uh, and, and what else? Um, this, this I found somewhere on the internet. <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't take it as gospel, but what, what is interesting is that uh, some guy did some study and he, he found that retrofit, uh, in essence, is faster than, than using the other libraries out there. So that's probably the, the main gist of this. I, I don't, I mean, I don't know how accurate the numbers are, but I, I, I do, I can corroborate, like, that retrofit, making calls with that retrofit is, is fast. So this, this is an example of the uh, converting the, the endpoint into an interface that I was talking about earlier. Uh, so this is, this is the basic structure. So you, you define an interface and you define basically all your endpoints. You, you can just define them, um, map them how you see fit. Um, and and basically you can map this to a call. So this, this user, can, you can plug it in with your own parameters and you make this call here and you out pops your, your data. Simple as that, right? Um, retrofit, the other advantage of retrofit is that it, it, it's pluggable results. What does that mean? Well, the default return data that we saw recent uh, in the previous slide is is a call response, and it has this data. So this is the default response that comes with Retrofit. If if you jumped onto the bandwagon with Rx Java, uh, that Retrofit says, sure, why not? You know, we can support that too. So so Retrofit can now s support returning observables, so, so you can plug it in directly if you're working with RxJava um, in, your, in your library, you can plug it in directly. Uh, so you can subscribe to this and, and do a whole bunch of uh, interesting RxJava stuff. So all, all you need is uh, one library, I think, and you can get the return data formatted to uh, RxJava type. And there, there's uh, Java 8 came out, they have this thing called observable list future or something like that. So Retrofit says, okay, yeah, sure, we can support that too. And, and they, they said, okay, you just need to compile a different library, uh, make a new adapter, and, and you get this observable future that, that uh, you can use with, uh, with whatever work you're doing in Java 8, I guess. So, so you get the, you get the return data that you want. You can also format the data that you want for your payload to send out to the API, or you, you, you can adapt to whatever payload that the API returns back to you. So typically, most of the day, nowadays, mostly uh, people deal with JSON. So you, you get back from the API service, you get back JSON and you, Retrofit provides a JSON converter, so you basically uh, you define your models and and you annotate it with your G JSON annotation, and you plug it in to the Retrofit service API call, and then you can send it out. When it comes back, it comes back in JSON. Then you then you run it through this JSON converter as well, and you can get to your data that that you want. Um, if some backend guys want to you give you XML uh, just to be mean to you or something. Uh, you can say sure, no problem. Um, you can convert. You can convert the XML payload just plugging in 
a new uh, XML converter and you can, you can still get to your data. Or if you want to write your own, some experimental stuff, um, and you're not using XML in your payload or you're not using JSON in your payload, uh, if you want to go binary or byte stream or whatever, you can, you can do that and write your own converter. So there's these open source libraries. They, they talk about how, how to write a converter. There's, there's a couple of method calls you need to implement, and you can get, again, to the data that you want. Oh, okay. <laughs> so uh, retrofit, it it's pluggable, so you can get you can get back the data that you want. It's uh, it's convertible, so you you can adapt to whatever kind of data that the API provides, or you can conform to whatever data that the API needs. Uh, so that that's something you can do easily in retrofit. Uh, that you probably will need a lot of more work in with if you're using an Apache HTTP client. Um, so authentication, uh, I, I'll probably have to skip through this a lot. Uh, you can do authentication either through retrofit or through OK HTTP. Uh, there, it how you really want to do it is is really up to what what your needs are. Uh, if you want to do it through retrofit, you would you would go through um, you would add this uh, authorization header uh, and you define it in your interface. If you want to do it through OKHttp, you can use their method call to add in your authorization header. So th I mean, there's either way. Um, but if you want to do something more complex, I like say like. Uh, OAuth token authorization or stuff like that. I, um, what I've done is using OKHTP. OK I found that that works a bit better. Okay, so error handling. Um, this is something pretty important, I feel, uh, because this is like every day uh, in the real world we, we deal with network problems. Uh, with Apache HP client, you you basically you're you have to try and catch that that error and and hope for the best, but with retrofit, they actually give you uh, these callbacks uh, so that you can, uh, you, can, you, can get, you can have a chance to actually handle that error so that it won't be a, a problem. Now, one, one thing I wanted to point out is the, uh, with retrofit, they there have a synchronous and an asynchronous call uh, with Synchronous call, uh, you may want to use that if you're already doing um, uh, network calls in your, in your own thread and, and you're dealing with your own threading. So you may want to use uh, s synchronous calls, but what I've found works better is, is the asynchronous calls because you have, the, uh, you have these errors that, that are given to you already right out of the box. So you can handle that, that timeout exception that I pointed out earlier. Um, okay, so one one last thing um, with retrofit. When I was writing, when I was implementing it for for uh, the Addis Clinic, uh, I started out with this. Right, uh, th this is uh, right out of the box, right from their example on their web page, uh, and you're mixing in the network call with this uh, set text. So this is UI here with the network call and I found like, you know, that there was one big problem with this um, and the big problem is that I would be depending on retrofit in my main activity or if I wanted in my view, it would be even worse. All my views would now depend on retrofit as well. Uh, so I found that to be a bit of a problem because I didn't want to depend on retrofit because what if they change their API? Uh, they, they said that's stable now, but you just never know, right? Um, so I don't want to depend on this because if the API changes, then, then I, have, I have all these changes to make. So, so what I found uh, worked better for me was to make my own callback and it gets me my data. So I only depend on this dependency. That I, I can control and it never changes um, and it gets me my data. So this app callback uh, is, is basically an extension of um, Oh, actually, no, this app callback is just basically, I, I make the call to retrofit, 
and I pass in my app callback. Retrofit has its own callback. Its own callback calls my app callback. So that way I have a separation from, from all the dependencies on Retrofit. So, so this is actually uh, called by Retrofit. That's how I, how I worked it out. Um, I probably don't have time to, <laughs> I, I wanted to do a code demo, but I, I don't have time, uh, unfortunately. Um, but uh, it, it's pretty straightforward. If you go to their Git, GitHub page, uh, there's also, uh, I have a link here. Uh, this, a lot of my, my ideas came from um, this little uh, link here. So they, they will walk you through what I wanted to do in, per, in a demo, but uh, they, they give you uh, all the steps on how to set it up in your Gradle, uh, how, to, how to configure your retrofit builder, uh, how, how to define your interface, and, and how to actually make the call. Uh, and it, it's, it's really straightforward once, once you see it. It's, it's not that bad at all. Uh, I, I also would like to refer you to uh, Jake Wharton. He's the guy who uh, wrote and took care of uh, Retrofit. He made a talk uh, of which I based a lot of my ideas from uh, on how, how it evolved, how Retrofit evolved from, from uh, nothing to 1.0 to 2.0 and why they brought in things like the, the pagination and uh, um, how they were dealing with the callbacks, why do they want to change that. So I'd, you, know, you might want to take a look at this because uh, it, it'll do way more justice than, than, than I could do in 10 minutes. And uh, th I think that's all I have. Uh, do you guys have any questions? So uh, retrofit, it. So the question was, how how does retrofit support HTTPS? Uh, the, it supports it right out of the box. You can you can plug in, you can define your endpoint as HTTPS. Uh, there there one thing that you need to be aware of when you're using HTTPS is the uh, the, the token. Um, it might expire, so you need to use interceptors. The other thing uh, is with HTTPS, uh, you, you, you might run into these uh, certificate security issues, so you might want to add um, some extra security. That part actually Retrofit doesn't deal with. Um, retrofit scope of the world is limited to interceptors, so it can only intercept what, what it's sending out the payload to, to the API and what it gets back. Uh, any lower level stuff, uh, if you want to deal with like uh, SSL pinning, stuff like that, uh, that's done by okay, HTTP Retrofit doesn't really deal with that. But uh, your basic HTTPS, you, you can plug it right in, uh, define your endpoint as HTTPS, and Retrofit Builder will work with it right out of the box. Yes, so Apache Client was one big monolithic uh, library and it did what both OKHTP and Retrofit does. It, so instead of using Apache Client, you use Retrofit to talk to your endpoints and OKHTP to do all the low level uh, uh, details of sending that data. So, so things, things like the SSL pinning, um, that, that would be done by OKHTP. Okay, uh, but anything like uh, your, your request parameters, like um, say you want to add something to your header, um, like content type, uh, you want to change your content type, or you want to you modify your path with, with your own user ID, that, that's all taken care of by Retrofit with, with the uh, endpoint definition in the interface. So yeah, if you've got more questions, um, we can handle them afterwards, I think. Um, our next speaker, if I can get that up, is Elizabeth Cross um, from here at Mobify. And um, I'm excited about this one because I like playing with animations <laughs> myself, you may have noticed. <laughs> um, so okay, 
Give it over to Elizabeth. I'm Liz, a developer here at Mobify. Oh. oh, so I'm a developer here at Mobify. I'm working on the Astro framework. It's a kind of a hybrid framework that we can write our app logic in JavaScript, and then um, our apps run in both iOS and Android, and it's pretty awesome for building e-commerce apps. So I'm here today to talk about um, exploring uh, object animators. So object animators were introduced in Honeycomb, and um, yeah, they're like the basic um, um, component for managing animations in Android. Um, they kind of replaced older, uh, older APIs that were used for animation. So going forward, I think on, um, object animators are what you want to look to when you're um, performing, performing animations on your views or any other objects in Android. So I made a little sample app. Um, so you can check it out on my GitHub. And I'm going to run it for you. And then we can talk about um, the code. So this is the guy I turn to if I want to find out anything about object animators. Chet is the guy who basically wrote all the Android um, APIs, uh, him and his team. So, and he does, uh, puts out a lot of great material on the Android developer blogspot and also on the Android developer, their um, YouTube channel. Um, there's tons of great videos about animation, and that's where I learned a lot of the information I'm sharing today. Okay, sweet. Let's check out my app. Oops. Oh, sorry. I'm not going to switch back and forth. I'm just going to like. I just need to see what's going through. Oh, perfect. Thank you. <laughs> OK, sweet. My app doesn't look like anything fancy, just about a, but just a bunch of buttons. But we'll see. Um, uh, uh, it's more for exploring the code than <laughs> making it look pretty. OK, so the first button we have is like a slide me button. So if I just tap on it, it's going to slide from one screen to the screen, and I can tap it again, and it slides back. And the next button I have is slide me question mark. So I can tap that, and it does a similar thing. But then I can pull the drop down menu, and that's a list of time, interpol or time interpolators that are affecting that button. So I can change it to, say, anticipate an overshoot, and now when I click the button, it kind of goes past where I wanted it to go and bounces back. And do the same thing on the way back. And I can quickly go through these. I can bounce it. So it hits where it's uh, finishing, and then it kind of bounces a couple times. And a linear one, super boring. <laughs> Just going at the same rate the whole time. And uh, fast in, slow out. So I think Chet describes this as kind of a natural motion where you accelerate out and then come slowly in. And these buttons below, um, they're spinning buttons. So um, the spin button just spins 360 degrees around its x-axis. And then I can spin it back the next time. Spin with reverse. It's spinning and then coming back to where it was without me touching it again. And then spin rotation. Uh, spin around a rotation point. I'm actually spinning around the top now. So you see the axis of rotation is at a different spot. And then two more buttons. Uh, grow me. If I tap on that one, it kind of doubles in size and then shrinks back down to its original size. And then move me. I'm going to move all the way around the screen. <laughs> Sweet. OK, so let's look at the code now. Oh, 
Why is it broken? Okay, I got it. <laughs> okay, so first, if we just want to look at the first button, that's the slide me button. Um, so what we're doing, uh, we have a making an object animator. So object animator just has these static methods th that um, create the object animators. So this is the view I'm acting on, so in my case, the button. And then I'm going to animate the X property of the button. And I'm just giving it a start location and an end location. So those I calculated in my code. You can go look at the GitHub to see. Um, so those are just float values of where it was starting and where it's ending. And then, um, so then uh, we saw that we can set the interpolator. So uh, we can, uh, they gave us all, a lot of those interpolators out of the box. Uh, basically, an interpolator chain, uh, Change, um, changes the animation over time, so the rate of change over time. Um, yeah, that's what the interpolator is doing. Then all we have to do is start the animation, and then the animation is gonna run. That's basically the whole code for sliding that button back and forth. And then just to dig a bit deeper into the interpolators, yeah, we saw all the examples before, so these are a lot of the uh, fun ones. <laughs> Find ones that come out of the box, and then interpolator is an interface, so you can go and uh, implement any any inter any uh, kind of action that you want. So now let's see, adding um, uh, animating a rotational property. Mm. So yeah, the second button we saw rotates around uh, s like uh, rotates around the x-axis in a 360-degree circle. So here, um, the property we're animating is the rotation of x, and we're anim uh, rotating it in a 360-degree circle. And we saw it can go back and forth. So depending on if spin direction is negative or positive, that's going to make it go forward, have a forward rotation or a backward rotation. Sweet, pretty simple again. <laughs> okay, so now animating a property with uh, rotation and we saw, or with repetition. So we saw that um, we can also just click the button and have it rotate around and then come back. So the way we do this is create our object animator again. That was pretty similar, but now there's additional uh, methods we can set on the pr um, object animator that will allow it to repeat itself. So repeat count one, just make it come back. And this time we want to actually reverse the animation that we did at the start. So you just tell it to reverse itself and it can do all the calculations and come back to where it started. And now uh, the next button we saw was changing the point of rotation for the view. So there's a property you can set on the button called set pivot y. Um, I think this should actually say x-axis, I made a mistake. So here I'm calculating, before the pivot, um, when I was rotating around the x-axis, it was pivoting at kind of the center of the button, so the middle y value. So I just calculate where the top of the button is, the top y value, and then um, set that as the pivot point of y. And then the code is very similar to before for creating the object animator. And then I just start the animation and we'll pivot around the top of the button and instead of the, around the center of the button. Okay, so yeah, that's great. We're animating one property um, of the button, but now we wanna animate multiple properties. So how would we go about doing that? There's like a couple different ways to do that, but um, this is kind of one of the more suggested ways of doing it. Uh, combining a bunch of properties into one object animator, and then they'll be played at the same time. So there's uh, an object called property values holder. So we can create one of these for the X. Um, so this is the growing button, so when we're growing it in the X and Y direction. So we want to grow both the X and Y values, uh, basically like double them in size, and then have them shrink down again. So you can define um, uh, a property values holder for each one of the buttons that you want to, or each one of the properties that you want to change in the animation, and say how you want to change it, so double in size. And then you combine them all into object animator.of properties value holder, and add the 
both the property value holders that you run it to run at the same time um, to this, and you'll get an animator that will do that for you. Uh, so, and then we want it to, it to grow and then shrink down again, so we just ask it to repeat once and go in reverse, and then once you start your animation, your button will grow and shrink again. Okay, the final fun uh, button we saw was to move it all the way around the screen. So have it uh, take its little course all the way around the screen. So the way you can do that um, is with an animator set. So the animator set um, basically takes in a bunch of different a set of object animators and you can actually ask it to play sequentially or play them together. So the previous example we saw, we could have played them, used an animator set too, but the more recommended way if you're playing together is to use a, a property values holder. So for this one, we want to play them sequentially. So we're doing something very similar to what we did at the start, um, moving them in the X, moving the X values and the Y values of the button, and basically just calculating where we're starting from and where we're ending, and do that for each one of the animators. So there's an animator to move it down, an animator to move it across, to move it back up, to move it across the top, and then back again to its original position. So that's five animators. We just ask it to play it sequentially and start it, and there you go, you got your button moving around. Sweet, so um, there's also another way um, to do animations, which isn't using object animators, but actually uses object animators um, underneath. So that's called view property animator. Um, I made a whole br another branch of this repo to show how to use view property animators. Um, basically, it's just you have a view and you can call the animate method, and that returns you a view property animator. And then once you have that view property animator, it's super easy to, uh, I should have showed a code example for this, sorry. <laughs> but it's super easy to, um, so you, they just have, once you have the view property animator, you can do like dot x and give it the end value, that's a method. Another method would be like dot y and give it the end value. And that would change both the y and, uh, move it in both the y and x and y direction together um, at the same time. So check out that other branch if you're interested on how to use uh, view property animators. Cool. Any questions? Yeah. So when you say the different way the button moves back and forth. Yeah. Um, how does that map? How, how does that coordinate? Like how does that work? Changes in layout. <laughs> so if the button is, you know, on the opposite edge and it's more about left, and you switch it past one and to the right, what happens? So you change it. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so you want to change the layout at the same time you're animating the buttons? Because my animation changes the position of the parent and my layout says otherwise. So they're conflicting. Uh, okay, I am not sure because I have not played around with it to that extent. So you should definitely try it out. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Yeah. Uh, so it was introduced in Honeycomb, so I think that's about as far as you can go back, like API 11, or maybe someone can correct me. <laughs> um, yeah, so I don't think they're backported past Honeycomb. And, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think there are a lot of prop. Oh yes, uh, can you set up any callbacks on whether the, the question was, can you set up any callbacks on when the animation completes? I think there are ways to do that. Uh, yeah, you'll have to check out the object animator. Um, I know definitely for the view properties animator, uh, there are uh, there is like a callback listener that you can add to it. So um, yeah, you can do that in that case. Any other questions? Thanks a lot. <laughs>
and uh, works uh, now Buddy Build. He's, he's one of the founders of Buddy Build. Uh, if you haven't checked out Buddy Build, do so. It's kind of cool. Um, and I'm going to hand it over to, to Johnny, I think. Um, hi, um, uh, I'm Johnny. Um, like Dean said, I was uh, I'm one of the uh, co-founder and uh, engineer working on a body build team. Um, today, I want to talk about how to um, improve uh, the quality of your Android app uh, through testing. Um, for those of you who uh, who don't know, uh, body build is a CI solution that's focused on uh, mobile with an integrated uh, deployment system. I think of it as a better uh, you know test fly or hockey app. And we, on top of that, we build an SDK, allow you to uh, get feedbacks and uh, crash reports from your, uh, from your testers. Um, uh, day to day at BuddyBuild, I focus on uh, building the uh, um, Android functionalities. Uh, interesting background story, before we started building BuddyBuild, actually, originally we were working on an app called uh, What an Idiot. Um, basically, one of the, one of the co-founders uh, gets, gets frustrated when people cut him off in the traffic. So what he want to do is he want to take a picture of the car and submit a report. May not be the best idea um, in the world, but like definitely made us realize there's a need for CI solution. Uh, before that, I worked uh, for Amazon in Seattle. Um, I work on the mobile shopping app. Uh, I work on the homepage, the product detail page, and the Lightning Deals page um, on mobile. Uh, so Kindle, Android, and iOS. Um, while working on those pages, I learned firsthand uh, how important testing is. Uh, I worked on this uh, Lightning DLS page about four months. Um, uh, we shipped a feature just in time for Black Friday. Uh, this is like three years ago. Um, but on the day, the, the entire um, category, uh, electronics category, didn't, doesn't show up, actually. Um, so nobody was able to shop the deals for electronics for like six hours or so. Um, uh, t turns out that the backend API uh, I used uh, uh, caps at 100 items per call. And if you ask more than that, it just returned nothing, actually. Um, and obviously, it only happens on Black Friday because normally you have like 20 deals or so a day. Um, needless to say, that, that was a super expensive mistake and uh, something could have been worded if I had uh, adequate testing. <laughs> and after that, I came back to Vancouver. I worked on the, the Fire Phone. Uh, some of you might remember. Uh, it has four cameras uh, in the front to track your face and renders like game-like elements on the screen, um, kind of like running a game all the time. Um, and because of that, it's got a, quite a huge battery, actually. Um, which in hindsight is really great because it makes a really good paperweight right now, actually. Um, yeah. Um, uh, more specifically, uh, I work on the Silk browser, um, which is a pretty good browser internally. Uh, it uses the same engine as Chrome, uh, but uh, we built a bunch of uh, cloud acceleration features uh, on top of that to bring to the, the next level. Uh, really, in the last three, four, three, uh, four months before launch, um, the whole team uh, focused on um, improving the quality of the product. Uh, we did that by writing, writing and running a lot of tests. Um, and today I want to share some of the learnings, uh, things we learned uh, from that experience and uh, some, some of the things I still learn at, at Buddy Build. Um, uh, here's some quotes I think about when I, when I make a change. Uh, you know, if you, you don't like testing your product, most likely your customers won't like to test either. Um, uh, software uh, testing uh, proves existence of test, uh, bugs, not their absence. You know, bugs are inevitable. During the development process, uh, <laughs> testing gave us a way to, to find them and fix them. So what's the solution here? Um, uh, I think uh, test farms, uh, click farms it will be the solution. Right? Just <laughs> kidding. No, definitely not. Um, so automation it will be the uh, way, to, way to do it. Um, let the CPU do the monkey work, right? So you can focus on building uh, more interesting things. Uh, with that automation, we were able to cut down our um, uh, uh, ship time uh, from four weeks uh, uh, at Silk to uh, less than a week. Um, and we were not alone uh, at Amazon. Uh, so 61% uh, of apps that use BuddyBuild uh, have some tests. Um, today we're going to cover uh, three broad categories of tests. Uh, there's UI tests, or some people call it acceptance tests. There's integration tests and, and unit tests. 
Uh, we're going to use a demo app to show you um, uh, wh what each, how to use each uh, uh, type. Uh, it's a simple note-taking app. You can you can basically view notes, open them, uh, uh, add a new one, uh, attach photos. Has a typical client-server API setup uh, with local cache, um, all the good stuff. Let's dive into um, uh, UI test. Um, so there's a there's a few options to uh, to write UI tests. A couple of frameworks out there. Uh, based on the, the thousands of uh, Android apps that use Buddybuild, um, Expresso is, is the most common uh, test framework we see. Uh, almost everybody uses it. Um, Expresso basically allows you to write uh, uh, concise, human-readable uh, Android UI tests. Um, it allows you to interact with the UI and assert the state pretty easily. Uh, there's another uh, fairly popular uh, framework, although it's very rare people use it. It's called UI Automator. Um, uh, the difference here is uh, UI Automator allows you to interact with other apps, uh, whether Express or only, you can only interact with your own app. And uh, with, with UI Automator, you can also interact with the, the system UI. Um, so you can like verify the app's behavior correctly uh, when people when, when user uh, flow uh, across into other apps or into the system UI. Uh, example of this is if you uh, if your test involves uh, clicking on the notification tray, make sure like you know the the correct DB get launched and it's populated with the correct data. Uh, let's take a look at an example. Um, really small. Cool. So, um, so this app, like I was saying, is a simple note, uh, note-taking app. Oh, cool. Um, what you can do it, you can add a note, basically, um, my thoughts, and you note here, you know, Android, it's awesome, right? That's a note, pretty straightforward. Um, we're going to write a test uh, just to mimic that, just to verify that works. Um, so this is my test. Um, right. So, um, like I said, Expresso test, um, you can pretty much, it's pretty much, uh, it's very, very human readable. Um, so um, we're going to walk uh, uh, line by line here. So basically what I'm doing is I'm getting the uh, add note uh, uh, button here, which is this button over here. And then I'm going to perform a click action on it. Uh, what Expresso does actually, um, so Expresso under the hood, how it works is actually it will, it will walk the, the view hierarchy and, and get the element, and it will calculate the width and height, and also based on the origin, it, it figure out the center point of your um, of that element of the, uh, the view. And it, it, when you when you do like for example click, what it does actually it sends a, a, a tab action, uh, like clicking on a pixel basically. Um, uh, so it's, it's very much like how you interact with, this, with the app, actually. Um, so it clicks on that. The next thing it does, um, simply uh, it gets the title. Um, it's an edit field, um, edit text field. And then uh, it performs a, a, a text input. And then uh, does the same thing for the description. At the end of it, what it does, it, it, uh, it gets the, um, the, basically the save button and perform another click. And on the way, uh, once it lands in the, the notes screen, it verifies the new node is added. Um, and that's it. That's the end of the test. Let's run it by doing this. That's it. My test is green. It's fairly straightforward. Um, Something new in uh, Android Studio 2.2 is introduced this thing called uh, uh, Expresso Recorder. So you don't even have to write any code, actually. Um, what you do is you can do this, uh, record Expresso test. It launches this uh, recorder. And you can do is you can just start clicking buttons. So I'm going to click this button. As you can see, it recognized I did the click. Then I can add a title, um, blah. All right, the description. I'm gonna click save. This recorded all my action. And at the end of it, you wanna do a assert of the state. So I just add assert. And I'm gonna click this, and it's very really pre-populated. The text is blah. And all I have to do is um, save and complete record. 
uh, sure. It generates the code for you, actually. Um, so you don't have to write much code, actually, um, which is pretty cool. Uh, Andrew's It, it recorded on the, um, I, I don't think it recorded actually elements, uh, the, sorry, the, the pixel actually. What it recorded is like the elements actually. So it found the element and record, uh, uh, did a perform uh, a click, which we can see here. Um, yeah, basically get by ID and according to layout, it's, um, I think it just tells it to do the center point and uh, um, yeah. Back slide, sweet. Yeah, so as you can see, UI test is pretty easy to, uh, very easy to write and pretty easy to read. Um, but 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 based on our experience at, at Silk, and um, they're really really flicky actually. Um, uh, so why why they're so flicky? Um, there are many reasons. Some are you can control. Some are uh, less um, less difficult, uh, less uh, more difficult to control. So one is the, the UI flow changes all the time. The UI ch UX, UX change, and you just have to rewrite um, the test, right? The, uh, turns out the ID uh, could change as well. So the ID, if you have a library that has resources you're referencing your app, those can change. They're not static constants, actually. Um, those can change. So what you have to do is actually, you have to write a, um, a public XML to hard code those IDs so they don't change. Um, there's uh, sometimes your window will go uh, into the background so you cannot click. Um, uh, one example is like there's a low battery or something or a notification or something, your window will be no longer in the foreground. Um, another thing really, really hard uh, uh, we faced is um, where sometimes we, we run like slow debug builds. There's a lot of timing issues and make it worse is we're actually running debug builds on debug system images um, in the early days. So we had to write like a whole framework around it to, to, to handle that. and. It's just basically a bunch of weights and you know a bunch of verifies. It makes things really really slow. Um, there's a, a few things you can do to make it a little bit more predictable. Uh, if you are on, uh, using emulator, make sure you use x86 emulator. They're a lot better. Uh, make sure you turn off animation, um, uh, like all the window transition and stuff. Um, and also, if you use an emulator, make sure you use a, the host GPU just in case. Um, but, but even with that, uh, emulator device is really still very un unpredictable. Um, uh, so like, if you can um, run it without, run your tests without uh, invoking, um, uh, involving emulator uh, in more isolation, um, it'll be much better, and, and you can. Um, um, you can write integration tests. Um, basically, integration tests sits between uh, UI tests and unit tests. They're not quite end-to-end, but they're also not very, very um, modular, not very, very isolated. Um, they test, um, they test the, the part of the system, um, uh, which normally involves calling some sort of a API into the Android system, um, uh, which is a little bit tricky uh, for Android because the SDK on your computer is actually, they don't have any implementation. Um, all they have is a bunch of stops. So in your, if you're in your test, uh, you're running off the uh, device and you try to invoke some APIs, uh, you get a runtime exception. Um, to solve that problem, uh, uh, a lot of people use uh, uh, Roboelectric. Um, uh, so Robo what Roboelectric does is actually, it provides a dummy implementation uh, for activities, for like any sort of um, uh, Android APIs at runtime. So you can run UI-like tests um, on, you, on your computer without involving uh, an emulator or device. Um, so going back to the, the, the demo, uh, if you take a step back, um, look at the test we just wrote, um, which is you know, add, a, add a new node. Um, we can actually break it in into, into three different tests. Um, you, you, first test is you can verify when you click the button, uh, another activity will show up. Um, another thing you can do is uh, you can verify after you uh, type in your uh, title and description, you click on the save, uh, a note does get saved. And then you can verify if a note gets saved to the store, uh, the, the view will get refreshed and the, uh, the note shows up. Um, so let's go back to the demo. Let me show you how to uh, rewrite the test using uh, Roboelectric. So like I said, you can divide the, the previous test into three tests. I, I've written two here. Um, uh, 
the first test, uh, basically what it does, it, it same, very similar. Um, the syntax is slightly different. Um, actually, before I dive into that, maybe it's worth mentioning this. So uh, you can see here, that's what the, the roboelectric magic happens. Um, you give it your activity and you tell it to set it up. What it does, it actually, it, it try to um, provide a bunch of uh, uh, functions to it so that your, your, uh, your activity actually, you can call into it. Um, once you set it up, you can do the normal, uh, you can code this like you normally uh, code uh, your, your, uh, your Java code. Uh, you can find view by ID, then you can call on click, um, something you normally do. Um, then what you can do is actually, um, uh, because there's no actual implementation, uh, what you can do is get the shadow application and query it and make sure like, there's a new activity getting launched actually, um, like this. So that's one. Um, the other thing I want to verify is when you save a node, actually it does give so save to the store. So sim very similar to uh, the previous test, you got a title, a description. What I'm going to do is I'm going to get uh, I'm going to I'm going to um, use the uh, add node activity. I'm going to get the view by ID, get the title, uh, edit text, uh, put the, put a text in there. Then um, I'm going to get the uh, save button and perform a click on it. Um, once that's done, I want to verify um, um, in my store, so the uh, model, in the model view controller um, sense, um, the, there's a new node getting added, and the node is the node I just put in there. You run it just like the UI test, but you'll notice it doesn't involve any uh, the emulator. And it runs um, a lot faster uh, because it doesn't need to install any, uh, doesn't install APK or test APK. Um, yeah. Sure, yeah. That's correct. So, oh yeah. So the activity doesn't have to be launched for you to to get the the views. Yeah. So that's where the this this magic comes in. So um, Robo actually set up activity. What it does actually, it will actually create activity and cause the inflation. Uh, it will inflate your uh, XMLs in a fake um, hierarchy, basically. Yeah. So so it set it up. So when you call get view by ID, actually Robo actually comes in, intercepts that, and it will it will actually search in its shadow DOM and give you actually a, a shadow view, basically. Yeah. That's how. That's how. Yeah. That's why you don't have to involve the the emulator or device. Cool. Um, so you can see, uh, Roboelectrics are generally they're they're far more stable than than UI test uh, and runs runs a lot faster than UI test. Um, uh, but one thing to know is they're they're not real because, like I said, the only implementations are are they're dummy implementations. They're they're not really um, Android implementations. And also another thing to note is uh, since nothing is actually drawn on the screen, when you actually get a UI element like a view, yeah, when you tap on it actually. Even if it's off screen, you can still tap on it, which is um, in, in a UI test case will we, we, we just uh, fail because you are actually not tapping anything. You're just getting a view and invoking the on call uh, listeners, basically. Um, so they're not real. Um, uh, but they, they do provide a, a, a lot stable uh, uh, run than the typical UI test. Um, but really, uh, if you step back again, uh, most of the time, what you want to test is. You really want to test your app in isolation. So uh, you want to test your app in uh, the, the, the background uh, background service service, and and to test that you you just simply write uh, unit tests. Um, um, with Android, you can just run uh, you can just write uh, regular J unit tests. Um, it uses Android J unit runner test runners uh, to run them. Uh, uh, it's very rare that your test, uh, your your uh, the class under test has no zero dependencies. Um, so to provide a better isolation, um, it, the good practice is to actually uh, mock the dependencies uh, of the class under test, and you can do that with uh, Mojito, uh, which is pretty popular. What what the mocking does actually, it basically stops out the class functions and intercepts them. So when you make a function call, actually, it's not calling the real implementation, rather your mock. 
Um, yeah, let's take a look at one of the demos. Right. So in this case, I again I can divide my previous previous um, testing to multiple um, uh, unit tests. Uh, what this does actually, so the app is based on MVP model or some call MVC. Really, is you know tomato tomatoes. Um, um, so what it does actually, what I want to verify first is uh, when I make a call, when I click on the save button, um, my presenter, which is a controller, uh, calls the correct uh, uh, model. And uh, and uh, make sure the UI is uh, is refreshed, um, and that's what it does here. So um, uh, the presenter, the controller, call, um, when you click on the button, what it does is it calls the save node. So it calls the save node, and I want to verify my repository with my model. Um, the f the save node function on the model gets called with a node class, and also I want to make sure my view uh, gets called on this function. So show node list, which will refresh the page. Um, these two things, um, the node repository and um, uh, at node view, they are not real um, implementations. They are mocked. Um, you mock it, simply just add a mock annotation and call uh, mojito annotations init mocks. They will create a mock object of that, um, of that object. That way you can actually intercept it so how this works is basically when uh, when the save node gets called, um, this guy gets called, but not a real one. And instead, the the Mojito um, implementation and Mojito actually records that, and that's how you can verify that did, that did get called. That's one. Um, this is another one. Unit test. This is more like a typical unit unit, uh, unit test. So basically, I have a node object. I call uh, save node on my repository, then I verify my, my notes, is, it's actually indeed saved. Uh, we can run this, this, it's done. So you can see, um, really, uh, unit has a super, um, super fast to run. Um, and they're the stablest uh, test uh, among the three, and also, uh, one one sad benefit of uh, writing uh, unit tests is actually it forces you or promotes um, write, promotes you to to write better code. Uh, you will end up writing more concise classes instead of like giant monolithic class. Yes. Con any context. It will be, but it won't have any intelligence built in. So all it does is record which function is getting called, actually. Versus a Roboelectric, when you call contacts that say get resource ID or something, it actually knows like you are going to pass in the resource ID. It's going to look up the resource, actually. So, so, um, yeah, do you have to make the, all, the, uh, uh, all the functions uh, uh, you, you test protected, so make it accessible? Um, so so Mahito provides some of that. It actually, you, you can, you can uh, call some private functions and mock the pr some private functions, uh, but certain things are, are not allowed. I think uh, uh, static constants in, or something is not allowed. There's another library you can use though, uh, to, to do that is uh, called power, power mock, actually. Yeah, it, it actually, you can mock anything you want with that thing. Yeah, um, really just reflection. Um, so like I was saying, uh, writing uh, unit tests will help you write better code, actually. Um, you can write more concise classes instead of one you know, giant monolithic class. Um, in general, we, we find this is a pretty, uh, based on the past experience, we find this is a really good um, uh, 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 a way to think about it. Uh, you want to write a lot of unit tests uh, and integration tests. Um, you want s UI tests to start, you can't replace UI tests, um, unfortunately, uh, but you can write very little UI tests. Normally, we, we, we recommend just cover the happy case. So UI tests will run through uh, uh, once, cover the happy case, 
the rest of the, the edge cases will be covered, you should cover with uh, unit tests or integration tests. And then there's some menu tests um, in the final pass. Like certain things are just way easier to do with, with menu tests, like did the drop down show up, for example. Um, there's a way easier. Um, so we took all these learnings and uh, we, we, we built a, the Android testing support at BuddyBuild. Um, we built a few neat things that help you run your tests and, and, and debug them. Uh, I'm gonna quickly show you how to uh, onboard app and run, run tests in, in, in BuddyBuild. Um, So it's, um, I'm going to onboard app, I just, um, our, uh, the demo app. It's pretty straightforward. All you have to do is go uh, pick your repo. I connected, um, uh, I signed up to BuddyBuild uh, using uh, my uh, GitHub OAuth. So it gets all my uh, orgs and uh, my repos. Let me find that app. So. All you have to do is go pick the work. Uh, actually, let me go bigger. Perfect. And build. Um, so what this does actually now is uh, we spin up a, a, a new Docker image, um, fresh Docker image, and uh, um, we uh, secure it. Um, then we retrieve the source code, um, put it under the box. Um, we support like you know, Bitbucket, uh, any sort of SSH, um, GitLab. Um, uh, once it, it's done retrieving the, the source code, uh, what it does actually, we have a intelligence, we have a plugin we made, um, a Gradle plugin we made. Uh, it actually analyzes your your app, and then figure out like which modules uh, you have in there and what variants you have in there, and we we'll just build automatically. This should only take like uh, a minute or so, um, but to save time, I onboard the app uh, beforehand. And this is that app. And I turn on the um, uh, turn on the test unit tests, both unit tests and UI tests for this app, and and run it. Um, as you can see, so app succeeded. Look at my um, this. Uh, these are the RoboElectric tests I just wrote. Um, uh, these are the other uh, unit tests. Uh, as you can see, RoboElectric tests take a little bit longer to run than um, unit has because it needs to download a bunch of things um, when it's running actually, the implementations. Um, we can also take a look at the uh, UI test. So this that UI test, it takes a lot longer to run. Um, what we noticed is, um, well, UI test is really flaky. So like sometimes you're really hard to figure out what's happening. Um, so what we did is actually, well, when you can download the log, which give you ADB log of the device, you can go there, read the log. But what's be better than that is we actually just show you like what happened actually. So we just record it and um, per device per per test um, per test case level. Um, yeah, really helps you debug the things. Um, and that's it. Yeah. Any questions? Yeah, <laughs> thanks. Uh, so code coverage, yeah, um, uh, it definitely does. Uh, so um, unfortunately, I don't have a <laughs> demo set up for it. Uh, uh, so code coverage basically tells you um, how much your code uh, is being touched, the code path or branches is getting touched by, you, uh, by your code, uh, either uh, unit test code or, or UI test code. Um, it, it's, it's pretty helpful. Uh, in general, um, the, you don't want to, it's unlikely you're gonna reach 90% code coverage. That just diminishing returns, basically. But like, a good number will be like, you wanna do like 50, 60% probably, uh, would be good, yeah. Yeah. Yes, oh, yeah. Um. Yeah. Uh, the, are you talking about the espresso recording thing? Uh, I believe it, 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 it does some intelligence, but like, um, 
I, I have to I have to double check on that actually how how well it does it. Um, it handles like really basic like run, uh, runnables. Uh, it, it knows there's runnable. It actually will be uh, will wait for it. Yeah. Uh, I think in your so in your code there isn't something new too. Is uh, in your code when you run some um, uh, you can actually tell like the system I'm I'm running background background code just wait for it um, stuff like that. Um, yeah. Sorry, you, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, so does body build support real device? Yeah, so the the test I was uh, I was showing you guys is actually running on uh, real real device. So in this case, it's running on Nexus 5. It's actually real Nexus 5 we're running on, not an emulator. Uh, you, can, you have a choice to run on an emulator or, or device, so, let me show you real quickly. So we have on-device testing. You have a bunch of devices you can pick. Um, Samsung, Galaxy, Motorola. If you don't like that, you can use emulator, although I don't know why you would. Um, <laughs> yeah, we do. Yes. There are they're sitting under my table. Um, no, uh, <laughs> no. The, the, we're using. Um, so this one is. Um, we, we have we have a couple of providers we we will use. Um, depending on the, the load, we'll load balance them. Uh, so this particular one is actually running off AWS device farm. Um, we have another one. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Thank you. So uh, thank you, Johnny. Um, and he's not just touching the surface of what uh, BuddyBuild does. Uh, go check it out. It's very cool. Um, so earlier I covered sponsors, and um, Mike was out of the room. So um, Mike needs to say some words now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I guess. Yeah, I'm a software engineer here at Mobify. Um, we do anything sort of like, I don't know, we got a lot of really cool tech we're working with. Um, Johnny mentioned they're using like spinning up Docker images and I don't know, some people get like super excited about that. We're also working with like cool stuff like Docker, um, working with a bunch of front end fun stuff like uh, React right now as well. Um, so keep your eyes out. I think we have like a few positions open, but um, we're always looking for good talent. Um, or if you have another meetup group and you need space, we always love like bringing people in and just sort of sharing off our space. Um, so we got like a cool video camera we can try to like stream stuff and things like that. So um, yeah, just be in touch with us. Yeah, we're moving in the end of November, beginning in sometime in November, hopefully. So after November, don't come to this office. We'll have a new address. <laughs> That's all. Their uh, new office, in case you haven't noticed it yet, is um, uh, on Granville. So it's, it's the fancy one. The big one there. Also says Microsoft on it, I think. Um, and um, I'm, uh, you know, as I mentioned, I run a company, Radical IO. Um, we also hire for Android, for iOS, for web. Um, my partner is at the back as well. Um, she's also a, a co founder of uh, Radical IO, Brianna Sim. Um, and thank you. Um, so make sure to. Continue to talk to folks. Networking is one of the most important things for why we hold the event. Um, learning, talking to one another, and, and figuring out things is uh, an important thing to do. So thank you.